uh, will explain why those patients that had progesterone removed at early part of the pregnancy, subsequently they will end up with miscarriage. And furthermore, we all know that uh, anti-progesterone has been established as a powerful inducer of abortion uh, for many decades. So if you look at the function of progesterone, um, uh, there are three main uh, role of progesterone in maintenance of pregnancy. The first one is the uh, is to modulate human response to the semi allergenic fetus. The second one is to induce secretory changes on the estrogen primed endometrium by promoting local vasodilatations and improve uh, endometrial receptivity of the embryo. And the third one is to maintain uterine quiescence. If the patient does not have adequate level of progesterone, majority of the patient will resort into miscarriage and also early preterm birth. So now I will talk about uh, immunomodulation of the pregnancy. Uh, as we all know, uh, the fetus carries about 50% of the paternal and also maternal genes. So the paternal genes component is uh, perceived as foreign uh, antigen to the maternal immune system. So there should be some modification of the immune system to, pre to, to prevent rejection of the fetus. So what happens in a normal pregnancy, there will be a paradigm shift of uh, from TH1 helper cell system to a more uh, TH2 prone uh, cell system. So this is achieved by adequate uh, level of PIBF, which is progesterone induced blocking factor. So what does it do? PIBF uh, basically will inhibit natural killer cells at the maternal fetal interface. And it also inhibit the release of arachidonic acid and it favors production of asymmetric pregnancy protection antibodies. So if you look into the uh, diagram on the right hand side, with adequate number of progesterone, you have adequate level of PIBF, therefore favoring a TH2 maternal immune uh, system modification. Uh, this is uh, this will provide fetus protection and the patient will it will be able to maintain the pregnancy until delivery. Whereby, if the patient has low level of progesterone or if you administer anti-progesterone medication for the patient, so you have a high level of TH1 maternal immune system, uh, whereby you get all these cytotoxic inflammatory abortogenic reaction, uh, high levels of interleukin-1, TNF-alpha and so on. And these are the group of patients that will end up with miscarriage. So what about evidence base? Uh, for the past uh, so many years, since 1953, uh, there are a lot of papers that have been produced looking into the role of progesterone in miscarriage. Uh, following that 1953, uh, we had 11 more trials, but the sample size were basically small and uh, they had weak methodology. So what about Dufaston? When we talk about progesterone in uh, clinical practice, we are basically talking about synthetic uh, and also micronized progesterone. So Dufaston is a synthetic uh, progesterone that is widely available. We have been giving uh, Dufaston for those patients with threatened miscarriage and also recurrent miscarriage. So this is a paper published in 2015. It is a systematic review of Dufaston for the treatment of recurrent miscarriage. So in this paper, basically, it looks into 13 reports on studies of the first in recurrent miscarriage. But out of those 13 studies, only three studies that fulfill criteria for meta-analysis. So the, the studies that... Uh, uh, that... Uh, Okay, so if you look at the studies that were included, um, uh, labeled as randomized control trial, the first one is double blind randomized studies uh, published by Kuma et al. in 2015. So he divided uh, the patients into two groups. The first 175 patients received Dufaston, given 10 mg VD until 20 weeks of gestation. And the control group uh, basically were about 173 patients. So this is a head to head trial. Uh, looking into the second uh, trial, the, the, the author divided the uh, subject into three groups, so it is not a direct head-to-head -head trial. And the last uh, trial basically had a very small sample size number. So out of this um, three randomized control trial, those patients that received Dufaston basically had 10% uh, incidence of miscarriage. Uh, and 23% of patients who did not receive any treatment continued to have uh, miscarriage. 
So we can conclude that looking at the results above, uh, there is 29% reduction in the odds of miscarriage. But can we use this uh, as an evidence to apply to all our patients so that we can start the first one? Uh, basically, there is some limitation because none of the trials specify the method of concealment of study group assignments and only two trials use a placebo for comparison. So the next uh, group of patients is to look into the role of progesterone for patients presented with treated miscarriage. Again, this is another systematic review uh, paper that uh, included about 21 reports on Dufaston. And out of those 21 reports, we had five RCTs that fulfill criteria for meta-analysis. So if you look at the overall results, uh, the groups that received uh, Dufaston basically had a lower incidence of miscarriage, about 13%, as compared to 24% of uh, patients in the control arm. So we can say that uh, those patients that uh, received Dufaston, they had significant reduction about 44-7% out of miscarriage. Again, the issue here is uh, the sample size of the study and also some of the trials did not uh, el uh, elaborate further on the confounding factors that may cause a bias in the results. So we have now moved into uh, micronized progesterone. So we had two large uh, trials discussing about the role of micronized progesterone for patients with miscarriage. Uh, this is again a paper that was published in 2016, uh, uh, basically a critical evaluation of randomized evidence. So there are two trials that were included. The first one is the PROMISE trial, which is progesterone in recurrent miscarriage. Uh, this is a randomized, a well-powered study, multi-center uh, uh, placebo control uh, trial, which included 836 patients, randomized into two groups. Uh, it took place in 36 hospitals in the United Kingdom and also nine hospitals in Netherlands. The inclusion criteria was women with unexplained recurrent miscarriage, at least three consecutive or non-consecutive miscarriage that were trying to conceive naturally. Um, the intervention group received 400 mg of micronized progesterone taken vaginally twice a day from the moment that pregnancy test was positive but should be no later than six weeks and the medication will be continued until 12 weeks period of gestation. And the other group received placebo drugs given twice a day as well. So the primary outcome that we we'll, uh, look into basically is the percentage of live births beyond 24 weeks of gestation. So if you look at the live birth rates in the progesterone group, the uh, incident is 65.8%. And those uh, that were in placebo group, 63.3% had life births of uh, more than 24 weeks of gestation. So there is very minimal increment in the uh, benefit of giving Dufaston. So, and as you can see, the p-value is also uh, not significant. However, if you look at the subgroup analysis uh, of the study, you can see that if we divide the patient into two groups, the first one are those patients with three previous miscarriages and the second group is those with at least four number of miscarriages. You can see somehow the progesterone did offer a uh, benefit uh, in increasing the uh, percentage of live birth. Okay, then if we further divide the number of previous miscarriage, uh, four and those patients who had four and five miscarriages basically uh, benefit more uh, by uh, taking progesterone. Uh, with a previous history of miscarriage. So what can we conclude from the PROMISE trial? Uh, basically, giving progesterone in early trimester for patients with history of unexplained recurrent miscarriage is not beneficial. With a very small, about 3% difference in the life birth rate and a larger p-value, making it not statistically significant. However, if we look into subgroup analysis, we are now uh, can uh, be uh, sure that the progesterone did offer some benefit uh, in increasing the number of live births. However, the number is very small. And we know that the best validity of subgroup treatment effect is by uh, performing another study with a larger number of subjects to know whether it is statistically significant or not. So after three years of publication of PROMIS trial, we came up with PRISM trial. Uh, this is a study that was published last year, 2019. Basically, it looked into the role of progesterone in patients with spontaneous miscarriage. 
So this time, the number of patients included uh, were 4,153 patients uh, that presented with vaginal bleeding during first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Um, the intervention group again received 400 mg of micronized progesterone given vaginally, BD, or rectally until 11, uh, 16 weeks of gestation. And the control group received placebo drugs. And the prim primary outcome is live birth uh, at 34 weeks gestation or more. So, uh, looking at the live birth rate, as you can see, the progesterone group, the live birth rate was 75% as compared to those in placebo group, which was 72%. So, basically, there is no significant difference in the rates of live birth. But if you look into the subgroup analysis, again, as you can see, uh, those patients with three or more previous miscarriages that were given to Fastone when they presented in early trimester with bleeding, they had higher uh, incidence of uh, life birth rate at 34 weeks gestation, which is 72%, as compared to the placebo group, uh, which was 57%, with a significant relative risk of 1.28. So, did the number of miscarriage uh, play an uh, important uh, factor? Yes, if you look at the number of miscarriages, if the patient had at least one miscarriage in a previous pregnancy, uh, the patient can benefit from progesterone. The risk ratio is about 1.05. But the benefit is greater if she had at least three or more uh, recurrent miscarriage. As you can see, the risk ratio increased up to one point. To it. So, what is the logic behind all this? When we talk about miscarriage, we know that a majority of the patients that had miscarriage are due to chromosomal errors, and the commonest would be the trisomy, followed by polyploidy and also monosomy. If you look at this chart, those patients that had higher number of miscarriages, as you can see, basically it was an euploid uh, miscarriage, meaning that the number of chromosomes is normal. Uh, and adiploid miscarriage usually occurs on a random basis. So what are the factors that can contribute to miscarriage if you have a normal embryo? So people have been talking about luteal phase defect, uh, which they postulated related to euploid miscarriage. So how do we test whether uh, the patient is having luteal phase defect? Basically, there is no available confirmatory test. Uh, when people talk about serum and salivary progesterone level, the sensitivity and specificity level is low. And the problem with HPE uh, interpretation is basically there is high inter-observer uh, interpretation and also variation. So there is a small study conducted in 2016 by Stephenson et al, whereby he included 116 women with history of recurrent early pregnancy loss with luteal phase defect. So in his study, uh, basically he did endometrial sampling to confirm the luteal phase defect and this endometrial tissue is used uh, uh, to, to be tested with immuno immunohistological staining, which is called as cycline E. And patient with luteal phase defect basically express a higher level of cycline E uh, expression on the endometrial gland. So uh, in this group of patients, they basically put the patient on micronized progesterone 100 mg BD during the luteal phase. And what they observed is uh, the group that received progesterone had 2.1 times higher uh, incidence of life birth rate as compared to those in control arm group. So with all this uh, evidence base that we had, what do we apply in our clinical practice? So we know that promise and presumed trials found a small but positive treatment effect that seems to be dependent on the number of miscarriage. So two factors that would benefit from progesterone is those patients who presented with early pregnancy bleeding, less than 12 weeks, together with history of at least one or more previous miscarriages. And this group of patients uh, should have been uh, offered micronized progesterone, 400 mg BD, at the time of bleeding, and this treatment should be continued at least uh, until 16 completed weeks of gestation. So if you talk about implementing these strategies in UK, this would result in additional of 8,450 life births per year. So I think that's all for my presentation.